Welcome back, tribe. Skill wars are the new trade wars by Economics Explained. Modern trade wars taking place right now in the world around us are costing the global economy trillions of dollars. But the impact of what is ultimately just taxes, tariffs, subsidies and quotas on internationally traded goods may be all but insignificant compared to fights over a far more valuable resource skilled labour. International trade used to be a slow and expensive practice, with small unoptimised ships carrying goods that needed to be loaded and unloaded by hand at either end. The standard intermodal shipping container was first invented in the early 20th century, but it wasn't until 50 years later in the early 1960s that its popularity exploded and became the industry standard for international shipping. Today it's unusual to transport goods without them being packed into one of these containers. Entire fleets of the world's largest ships and shipping ports have been designed from the ground up to work with nothing other than these containers. Highly efficient systems are often the most fragile, and these rigidities have caused some problems. One of the largest contributors to supply shortages in 2021 was a shortage of shipping containers rather than a shortage of goods. Despite these problems though, global trade is now easier and cheaper than it ever has been. Which means that it's often cheaper to make something on the other side of the planet and ship it over the ocean than it is to make something domestically. Mm. In fact, it's almost always cheaper. Double Even in the Lord. USA, a country with a huge manufacturing industry, only 53% of final demand for manufactured goods is supplied by domestic manufacturers. To a lot of people, that figure might even sound high, which only shows just how normal it's become for our demands to be met from suppliers all over the world. Globalisation has overwhelmingly been a positive process for the global economy. Dozens of countries around the world have been able to rapidly develop by providing low-cost goods and services to advanced economies, and many of them now have robust advanced domestic markets of their own. But of course, there have been losers too. Workers producing items that can easily be shipped all over the world now have to compete with everybody in the world, not just in their own country. <coughs> Job losses are never politically popular, which is why despite the advantages of free trade, import restrictions exist in every major economy around the world. One of the most valuable and influential things entering and exiting economies these days are people. And just like goods being packed onto container ships, it's become a lot easier for skilled workers to be moved from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world with very few real restrictions. Just like free trade, skilled migration already has winners and already has losers. And just like free trade, these movements are inevitably going to become a powerful geopolitical tool. So, what countries are currently gaining the most from the increased movement of skilled workers around the world? Brain drains. What countries are losing the most? What economic tools could countries use to fight these skills wars? And finally, what impact could this have on individual people, individual nations, and ultimately the global economy? Skill well, we already know the winners and losers in the United States. Corporations have cut costs dramatically on their products and their bottom line has increased big time. Record profits. Meanwhile, the little guy, the factory worker, the laborer, the guy transporting your goods in the truck, he's getting less than he's ever gotten in comparison. Think CEO pay ratios or just salary versus inflation. And our middle class is drying up here in America because we shipped off all those manufacturing jobs, millions to the tune of millions of them, transformed ourselves into a service-based economy, and voila, here we are today. The average man is lost, doesn't know what to do. You know, there's always a downstream cost that we don't take into account. Although our products may be, quote, cheaper to be made in China, we've lost our ability to earn money here from the millions of jobs that got shipped overseas. Hey everyone, if you have a minute, please head over to legionofmen.store and grab yourself some cool merch as well. We have a bunch of limited edition designs, brand new stuff on the way, and all the proceeds go to supporting the channel. We don't want to be sponsored by corporations where we have to submit videos for review, have our speech impeded, or push any products that we don't use. So thank you so much to everybody that goes into the shop. Again, it's legionofmen.store. I'll put it up here for you guys. First time customers get a 10% off and we have a bunch of great designs by artists from the community that watch the channel and support. They get proceeds as well, a percentage of everything that gets sold. So community funded through and through. And it's no synthetic fibers on any on our products. We're using cotton only, of course. I got your back from all those chemicals from synthetic fibers. Again, appreciate you guys. Let's continue. Skilled migration is almost always a net benefit for the nation receiving the skilled migrant because the government can control how many people are allowed into the country, under what conditions, and for what skills. Usually advanced economies, which are the most attractive destination for skilled migrants, are not going to open up skilled visa programs to foreigners if roles can be filled with citizens because it's those citizens that vote for government leadership and they are unlikely to vote for a government that's replaced their job with a skilled migrant. 
Skilled migrants can also contribute to the economy in other ways as well. Here in Australia, our economy is heavily dependent on providing university degrees to international students. Despite our country's immense natural resource wealth, education is still one of our largest exports. What this does for the economy is bring in someone that will directly contribute a significant sum to the local economy through university fees, and then contribute more to pay for housing, food and general consumer goods and services. They do this for three to five years before they become skilled workers at the very start of their lives, and the country hosting these students can either decide to send them back to their home country, or offer them a working visa where their skills will contribute to the host country's industries, and their taxes to the host country's government. The United States, Canada and the UK also greatly benefit from skilled migration and international students, although to a lesser degree than Australia. Although not as direct, countries can also benefit from skills transfers in other ways as well. Certain countries, especially those developing major economic projects, often attract expatriate workers, which are different from skilled migrant workers because they only intend to be in the country for a fixed amount of time. While the host country doesn't get to keep the skilled workers, and depending on how long the expat stays in the country they might not earn tax revenue from their work either, it can still sometimes be an even more beneficial arrangement because the workers arrive right as they are needed, they apply their skills to develop a project, and then they leave. When Taiwan was rapidly expanding industrial infrastructure in the 1970s, it brought in thousands of expatriate workers to help design and oversee these once in a generation projects. Instead of training its own citizens to be able to design and construct a nuclear power plant from scratch, it brought in experts from all over the world. These expats had already constructed similar power plants before and they were ready to start construction Smart instantly rather than wait a decade for a local team to receive the training that they would need to do it themselves. These skills also wouldn't be very useful after the plant was built because in the 50 years since, Taiwan has only ever built two more nuclear power plants and two of them are now being decommissioned. The construction of major projects like this is an extreme example, but there are similar projects to this happening all around the world at the moment. The Gulf states have intentionally been building big dumb mega projects for decades now. The reason they've been doing this is not because the world's tallest tower or man-made islands have any utility in the middle of a desert with endless space and waterfront. They do it because big projects like these attract skilled foreign workers and businesses that want to make money off them, and in doing so set up in the host country, share in the skills and also make the region a self-sustaining centre of business and commerce. Even on a smaller scale, temporary expats can add a lot of value to an economy by training the local workforce on how to establish and run local industries. A major reason why countries like Japan, South Korea and Israel were able to develop so quickly in the last half century, when compared to early industrialisers like the USA and Western Europe, is because the technology was already created and they could hire skilled people from around the world to teach them how to set up and run advanced world leading industries. A quick disclaimer is that, of course, it's not as simple as just flying in people with industry skills. And even with the benefits of being able to import existing technologies and expertise, these countries still had to manage their economies. Also, you know what the issue is with, for example, US and China, just because they're adversaries on the world stage, a lot of Chinese students come here, they learn in the States, and then they take their skills and everything they've learned back home, and then they compete against us. So how beneficial is it for them to come here, spend some money in the quote, local economy, but then take the valuable skills that it took us years to learn and to teach and then apply it overseas, probably with less bureaucratic red tape because it's probably all state funded and then leapfrog us in multiple industries. So that's happening. And then two, I don't know how prominent, you know, this issue is, but spies obviously will be utilized through programs like this very easily. You send somebody undercover, they act as a student, they, you know, intelligence gathering or foment dissent, stoke civil unrest, yada, yada, yada. We've been known to do it. I'm sure other countries do it to the United States. So it's definitely not perfect. It's very carefully, but this certainly made it, at the very least, a lot faster. Today, all of these countries are major contributors to the global economy. They're home to extremely valuable industries and their exports are cheaper and often of better quality than what could have been provided by the global market without them. Part of the reason for the collapse in global shipping prices that we explored at the start of this video is because of the shipyards that were built in South Korea. Today the country is the largest shipbuilder in the world, and just like you might find it hard to find a consumer good that wasn't made in China, it would probably be equally as difficult to find one that wasn't transported on a South Korean ship. This is an amazing demonstration of the general rule that every change in the global economy changes at least two other things. But in the case of the free exchange of skills, it seems as if these changes are nothing but positive. But just like the free trade of goods and services across the world, skills exchanges have had even bigger winners and bigger losers. 
During our research on this video, we were lucky enough to speak to Dr. Billary, the Dean of Bocconi, one of the top universities in Italy. His insights were fascinating, not only from his distinguished career as an educator, but also as someone at the forefront of one of the countries most heavily impacted by the free flow of skilled labour around the world. Mm -hmm. Actually, Italy is a net sender of graduates rather than a net receiver, and that's one of the parts that the country is complaining about. So we, we'd love to have to attract more uh, people with a degree. Yeah, Italy's dying, man. From what I've heard from Italians that are living here abroad in Romania, either temporarily through some work set up or traveling, passing through, and the videos we've seen of those dying towns that desperately need people to move in i mean imagine that a, of like a vast majority of those videos that we see you know these small towns pay you to move here we're all from italy the demographic shift there is quite nuts i mean every young person it seems like is either going to the big cities in italy for university or completely taking their skills overseas blows my mind free uh, rather than uh, letting them leave to to other countries so I think from the country perspective, it is a, a problem, especially if you are uh, one of the sending countries. However, let me say two things on this. One is that uh, from the individual level perspective, uh, having more freedom of movement is certainly giving the right incentive to individuals. You want to build a, a good life, you have good ideas. Uh, it's, a, it's fantastic for the world to let these people move. Uh, the second point of view is that we have to understand from, from the competition uh, for talent perspective that countries that are uh, losing these individuals, maybe because they tend to be overeducated for the level of the economy in that country, should think seriously about uh, the, the opportunities that in a, in a specific country or region are given to these individuals. Italy is an advanced economy with very high standards of living by global standards, but its economy has still been falling behind its Western European peers, which have in turn been falling behind a lot of other major advanced economies around the world, the USA in particular. Job opportunities for young skilled workers in Italy are limited, youth unemployment is high, and youth underemployment, where people are working jobs that don't utilise their skills and normally earn less than they could be, is also another major problem. The definition of employment that most economists putting together national unemployment statistics use is anyone over the age of 16 that has completed at least one hour's worth of work in the previous week. Hmm. What's more is that if that bar wasn't already low enough, unemployment is only counted amongst people who don't do at least one hour's worth of work in a week, but are still actively looking for a job. With more gig economy work... And there he did, he said it, with gig economy work. This, I wonder what the true unemployment numbers are in the economies that we're living in today. The numbers have to be completely staggering because the fact that the government has to redefine what it means. Oh, if you just work one hour a week, that's not a job. You can't survive off that. That's like me helping my parents at their store. I go in once, one hour a week, one day a week just to help around the family business. That's not a job. Part-time work, that's not a job. We should count employment simply how many people are full-time workers earning a living wage. That's what employment should be. Anything below a living wage shouldn't be considered a job. It should be considered temp work. Being a grocery bagger, making minimum wage, not being able to survive off that, that's not a job, that's temp work. Our goal as an economy should be to have enough jobs for people to survive on. Crazy, man. Our expectations of our fellow man in our countries is so shit. We've gotten to the point where we don't care about one another so much that like, yeah, fuck that dude bagging groceries. He should get better scales. He should, you know, and there's some truth in that, but how we look at each other how disgusted we are with one another is the reason why we're ending up in this mess man it's all about me 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 f the other guy don't care about my fellow man and then we wonder why the moral fabric is decaying at the rates it's decaying we wonder why politicians are acting in the way they're acting we don't care about one another that's metastasizing in all aspects of society today they can easily give people an hour's worth of work without really providing any of the benefits to the workers or the economy that would come from a typical job adding value in a skilled role, unemployment figures normally sound a lot better than reality. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to be making two entire videos on the fading Italian economy and the lies that economists tell using economic figures respectively, so I don't want to get stuck into too much detail here just yet, but make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on those once they come out. 
The takeaway in the context of the free exchange of global skills is that despite making heavy investments into education, and despite still being an advanced economy with high incomes by global standards, a lot of Italian students are still moving overseas as soon as they can to find better There it is, you see. On an individual level, this is understandable. If better opportunities exist, then people should have the right to take advantage of them. But on a national level, it presents a serious dilemma. Education in Italy and most economies around the world is heavily subsidised by the government to a high school level. Then in a lot of other economies, Italy included, tertiary education is also subsidised in one form or another. If an Italian student has their education paid for up to graduation from university, then they go on to work in Italy for the rest of their lives, the additional income they will get from being able to work in a more productive role made possible by that education should, all other things being equal, more than pay itself back in additional income taxes and overall economic prosperity for the country. But if that student graduates university and then can't find work in Italy and decides to move overseas for better opportunities, then they won't pay taxes in Italy and their labour will be adding value to some other economy. Communications technologies, easy international travel and the widespread adoption of skilled workers programs have made this far easier than it was in the past. Just like removing the barriers to global trade created a race to the bottom of which country could produce things for the lowest cost, removing the barriers to workers has created a race to the top of which countries are willing to pay the most for certain skills. Italy is one of the biggest losers of highly skilled graduates in the world, but other advanced economies like New Zealand, Spain, Portugal, Greece and to a lesser extent Canada all suffer from the same issues. It's not fair for a country to put restrictions on where its people can live and work. The few countries in the world that do are not exactly models of ideal economic outcomes. But it's also not fair or sustainable for taxpayers to subsidise the education of workers that will never produce output for the country that paid for their skills in the first place. Italy is a country that is already struggling with an ageing population and declining worker productivity. It really cannot afford to lose what few young skilled workers it already has, so it's going to need a solution to this problem that doesn't appear to have a fair answer. So far we've also only looked at advanced economies, and while they are going to have to deal with these challenges as well, they have it easy compared to developing and undeveloped economies. Even if workers can find jobs in these countries, income levels are far lower than the global average and working conditions are generally worse. Beyond just income opportunities, developing economies will have poor healthcare, fewer utilities and yeah, less access to education for people and their children. A lot of people from advanced countries will live and work overseas as an experience or as a way to help their career, often with the intention of eventually moving back to their home countries. But a lot of young people from developing economies gather skills with the sole intention of working in an advanced economy. Certain industries suffered when they were outcompeted by outsourced service and manufacturing centres in countries with lower labour costs. But this trend could threaten entire economies that simply can't be competitive while losing their youngest and most productive workers. But if this is already such a problem and one that's likely to get even worse, then how are countries going to fight for skills? Regular trade restrictions are implemented in four sort of distinct levels using two different approaches. So before he gets into this section, we've already talked about before on the channel trades and why young men should consider trades instead of college. There's a bunch of men that watched this that have chimed in in the comment section multiple times where they went and they've done a apprenticeship in a trade, ended up coming out with very little debt, if any at all. Everything was covered almost. They even get a truck, they get tools. Jobs are lined up for them. Of course, it's not always perfect, but compared to just going to get a run-of-the-mill degree at college, it incredible. There's multiple stories of men finishing trade school, making close to six figures, doing some crazy shit, welding, whatever it is, and compared to their peers that chose college instead, they already own their house or about to pay it off completely. They have multiple vehicles, one for work, one for leisure. Um, sure, their job blue collar is harder on the body and you're out in the natural elements at times, but I would argue, although harder, probably healthier, probably better for you long term, mentally and physically than sitting in a box under synthetic lights in an air conditioned room staring at a screen all day. If we want to talk about physical and mental health, I would say that moving your body and being out there in the elements is probably healthier for you, although you may hate it. Although it's, quote, hard work, you know, and although we're bitching when we're out there, you know, wiring up a house, when we're doing plumbing, when we're welding shit and all the other trades that are out there, I would wager that most of those men would still choose a hard day's work at what they do than being told to sit in a suit in a cubicle of a 100 in a room 
under those shitty lights, hearing nothing but click clack all day. I wonder, what do people in the comments section think of that? And skills wars will be fought the same way, only in reverse. The tools that countries use to limit foreign trade are direct trade restrictions like import taxes, quotas and bans, or domestic subsidies. If a country doesn't want China to flood its local market with low-cost consumer goods, it can introduce an import tax on them. Which means after that artificial increase in price, the imported goods will be less competitive than domestic goods. If that doesn't work, then another alternative is just to directly limit how much of a good can be imported every year through a quota system. This will incentivize local manufacturing to fill in the shortfall. In certain cases, countries can also just outright ban certain products from entering their domestic market, either from select countries or from anyone. All of these will artificially limit the supply of goods in the economy, increasing local prices, which is inflation. But a lot of times that's a sacrifice that these countries are willing to make. Most countries by default have basic trade restrictions because they want to protect their local industries that provide employment. But given the benefits of global trade, they will enter into trade agreements to drop these restrictions with select trading partners. The most obvious example of this is the European Union, which outside of very select products mandates that all countries trade freely with one another without any of these restrictions. Since inflation is not politically popular and trade deals can create entirely new job opportunities by expanding local industries, another more subtle tool is often used by governments to protect their local industries. If the country trying to defend itself against cheap Chinese imported consumer goods was forced to drop their tariffs, quotas and bans as part of a trade agreement, they could achieve the same outcome by just subsidising local industries. If domestic businesses were given grants or access to guaranteed buyback programs by the government, they could continue to operate competitively and keep on employing people. If a microwave imported from China would cost $100 and a locally manufactured microwave would cost $120, then a $20 subsidy could keep the locally made goods competitive in the market in the same way that a $20 tariff on the Chinese import could. The subsidy approach also means that goods are kept cheaper. Microwaves in the market using subsidies would cost $100, whereas microwaves in the market using tariffs or quotas would cost $120. While this sounds great, there is always a trade-off. If the government is spending money to make local goods more competitive, it is eventually going to have to offset that additional spending with additional taxation, which should, all other things being equal, make the purchasing power of the average household exactly the same as if microwaves were $120. It's just now that extra $20 is going to be paid in taxes rather than at the checkout. In reality, all other things are not equal. Inflation or the higher price level of goods and services normally impacts poorer households more greatly, while higher taxes more heavily impact richer households. Again, what's important for the issues of trade wars and skills wars is that there is a trade-off. Often one of the biggest advantages of subsidies is just maintaining industries that are worth having even if they aren't globally competitive. One of the largest subsidy programs in the world is the US government's buyback of agricultural products, often well above market prices. The stability this offers US farmers, who know how much their harvest is going to sell for, means that the USA will always have a strong agricultural industry, which gives the country the huge advantage of food security, which in the eyes of policymakers is worth having a slightly inefficient market. So the movement of goods and services between countries goes from completely free trade to regular trade restrictions to trade wars, and then on to outright sanctions at the most extreme end. For goods and services, countries control where their partners sit on this spectrum through restrictions and subsidies, and it will work exactly the same way with people, just the other way round. While countries want to restrict the import of foreign goods and services and encourage their local goods to be exported to other markets, they want to encourage the import of skilled workers and restrict their own skilled labour from leaving the country. Although in both cases the end goal is to maintain and expand local industries. So far the only thing advanced economies have needed to do to attract skilled workers is to increase quotas, a classic tool used to restrict trade. When economists are talking about human beings they don't actually call it quotas, they call it visas, but it's effectively the same thing. A skilled worker that wanted to move to Australia would need to apply for one of the limited number of skilled worker visas and be approved. By easing this limitation, Australia could effectively attract an unlimited amount of skilled workers. Other countries that are less attractive to foreign workers need to try- You know, and I've been thinking about this. If we have something like, um, say, food security as a national issue, wouldn't it be better to deglobalize ourselves? For example, we should be moving to more local farmer-based farmer's market setups for all local communities. Imagine a world where you would go to a local farmer's market, everything you buy was sourced, mostly in your state, mostly in your city or county, whatever you want it to be. We would break the monopolistic power of these multinational producers, you know, think big meat, big veggie, big soy, big corn, big whatever. 
you know, all the major companies that have outsized political influence and basically wield it to protect themselves. Imagine if we went back to a more local system or somewhat regional. Wouldn't that solve the food security, national security issue and over dependence on international trade? Wouldn't that therefore make you far more robust than, say, the subsidy system that we have right now? Because the subsidy system we have right now, paying for, quote, inefficient markets, is really going to subsidizing major players in said market that can't compete or want to on an international level. Are we therefore growing things we don't need in markets like this? Like how much do we need all this corn, really? What's the real demand of corn? As opposed to something like tomatoes, beef, chicken, eggs, milk, right? A lot of these products would vanish off the market and probably not even needed day to day in a person's life. And it seems like you would bring back quality as well, because when you shop a regional or local, things tend to be produced from people who actually care about their product, who are actually invested in the community, who care about their customers because that's your neighbor. And part of the issue we have now with the quality of food in general is because it's produced by multinational corporations, they have no skin in the game in the local community. They don't care about the people. They hardly care about the product. The most they care about the product is the very bare minimum to pass legal requirements to be able to sell said product. Yeah. Then you have chicken that doesn't taste like shit. Tomatoes and vegetables and fruits have no taste. They're just oversized. They all look the same. Sprayed with God knows what. Always in season year round, which is extremely weird. We shouldn't have access to everything all year round. It's just not normal. If you've ever been overseas, Americans, this is hard for them to understand. But if you've been overseas and you've been to a farmer's market that's selling local from the people and you're eating fruit and vegetables that are in season, it is insane how different it tastes, how different it looks. And you'll never go back to eating the way you used to. But that's counter to big business. <laughs> this is we're in a profit world here. How do we make more money? That's all that matters. I know. We'll GMO that. Oh, look at that. We can grow it all year. Oh, my God. It's pesticide resistant now. Spray the shit out of it. A bit harder and offer incentives to the people coming in. This could come in the form of low taxes, discounted housing, guaranteed jobs, or some combination of all of these. This is still rare, but countries and even cities have made headlines by offering houses for a dollar. There it is, and yeah. Countries like the Gulf states from earlier are also making themselves attractive to workers by having very low taxes. What these countries are effectively doing is offering subsidies to attract skilled workers. This doesn't sound so bad until it's realised that governments could also use tools like tariffs and outright bans. A tariff would come in the form of taxation on workers leaving their home country, on top of the taxes they would have to pay in the country they end up working in. This is called citizenship-based taxation as opposed to residence-based taxation, which means people pay their taxes only in the country where they live and work, even if they are a citizen of another country. Today, there's only one country in the world that has this system, and that's the United States. Partially this is because the US is one of the few countries with enough influence and administrative capacity to make sure all their citizens are paying taxes no matter where in the world they end up. This can make leaving the US for better opportunities artificially less enticing because their citizens would end up paying two sets of income taxes, which would probably eliminate the benefit of the higher income in the first place. Some other countries have more targeted versions of these tax rules where citizens will need to pay taxes in their home country if they move to a tax haven. More and more countries are now considering a similar model to the US system, so they'll still benefit from their skilled workers, even if they do lose them. For developing countries, this could be a huge opportunity. The government could generate a lot more tax revenue by sending a worker overseas to a high income country than they would by keeping that worker on shore and taxing them at a job with a lower income. If countries could effectively do this, then skilled workers could become a very valuable export. There are challenges. Countries that want skilled workers are under no obligation to share how much a migrant or expat worker is making with their home country, and developing countries certainly don't have the capacity and influence of the USA to make them cooperate. The most extreme way that countries could win the battle for skilled workers is simply by banning their own people with certain skills from working abroad. This obviously happens in authoritarian regimes like North Korea, Russia currently, the Soviet Union back in the day, and Iran to a lesser extent. But even advanced, open, free, and democratic countries have started implementing some restrictions on where skilled workers can and can't work. US citizens or residents with skills in the semiconductor industry are not allowed to work in the Chinese technology industry. For now, this is a move motivated more by geopolitics than pure economics, but it has shown that it's possible and could continue into the future. The unfortunate part of any restriction, be they of goods, services, or people, is that they come at the expense of the prosperity of the global economy in aggregate. 
The world is a much richer and more prosperous place today than it has been in any point in history, and that's thanks in part to these freedoms. Freedoms that can also offer a better life to millions of people. Hopefully before we start fighting skills wars, policymakers do consider that a better GDP figure doesn't mean much if it comes at the expense of their people's way of life. Thanks for watching, mate. That was a great video. Um, economics explains skill wars are the new trade wars. And then we have some comments here. As an Indian, it's worrisome when some of my friends want to leave the country that nurtured them, but at the same time, what to do? This same country does not respect their skills or hard work. Here in Canada, we have relied on a number of imported skill workers. We bring in numerous doctors and lawyers and then turn them in into great fast food workers serving coffee, donuts, and burgers. I'm Italian and I've attended Brocconi University, and I can confirm that most of the graduates look for job opportunities abroad once graduated, and many, including myself, leave. But what you failed to mention is also far fewer years abroad, and most return with much better skills and experience. Of my peers, 90% went within two years from graduation abroad. Because if you want to have a good career, you need it in your CV experience in a foreign country. But within 10 years, most came back and now have senior positions with high paid jobs. Yeah, that's one of the benefits. So Romanians are doing this a lot. I talked to a lot of young people and they've told me the same. They're basically going to school here or abroad, working abroad, probably in the same time frame, five, 10 years, getting experience, coming back, starting businesses here with everything they've learned. It's very much a temporary setup. Very few end up staying abroad. And the issue is it comes down to culture, man, family. You just, it's nice to be in a foreign land but you never feel at home and you start to miss those childhood things you start to miss the way the air smelled the food taste the way the people greet you there's things that you just can't replace money will never replace these things and when you're young you want to go out venture out explore the world make a name for yourself see some things different than home but ultimately you will always be pulled back to where you were originally from and this dynamic is mostly applied to people coming from poorer countries going to more advanced ones we're not even going to get into the ones where you're born in the advanced country you learn your advanced skills there there's no jobs for you on the market because say like h1 visa programs just hired a bunch of cheaper skilled workers from overseas and then you just say f this and you take your skills overseas to just leave behind your quote developed nation that's a whole thing too as an Italian, I can't agree more. I have a bachelor's and master's degree with maximum grades and I work in hand or even under people with just a high school diploma at the same salary. The feeling of underemployment is very heavy, so heavy that next month I'll leave my job and start looking abroad. And that's shared basically between all my uni mates. I'm an Italian citizen that left and I have no attention until coming back until retirement. Italy will continue to bleed talent as long as rage as long as wages remain half of what they are in the rest of Europe. Work culture totally lacks any whiff of meritocracy, and the state does its best to demolish private enterprises rather than support them. Oof. Again, if there's opportunities, people will stay. So there's political issues going on in Italy and the rest of these countries where the citizens are fleeing. There's a reason people are leaving.